Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31. There you will find where we have been for the past two weeks. The word of the Lord, Isaiah 40 and 29, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. The Lord had a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his word. Father, this morning we come in the name of Jesus. We are standing on your word. We are thankful. We are grateful. We do remember how you set us free, how you brought us out, how you brought us in, how you lifted us, how you took us through. And we are mindful ever constantly of how good you have been to us. There is no God like you nowhere. There is nobody anywhere that's like you. Who is like unto the Lord our God, mighty in power, omnipotent in grace. We we stand today, God, just standing on your word, standing on your promise. Believe, wait. Uh, For the record, in many of our areas of our lives, Uh, Just to be clear on this so nobody will leave confused, in many areas of our lives, we're not waiting on God. Don't miss the qualifier there. In many areas of our lives, we're not waiting on God, but God is waiting on us. And in all areas where we're not doing what we should be doing, and we know we should be doing it, then we're not waiting on God. No, because God has already told us what to do. Hello, somebody. In, in the area that we know that we should be doing something that we're not doing, and we know better, come on, God is not waiting on us. Uh, we, uh, God is not, we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. God is waiting on us. And then also where we know we shouldn't be doing something that we are doing. That's although that's practice and sin. Let me just clarify that. Those that's living a double life. uh, One way on Sunday and somebody else Monday through Thursday, Saturday, Friday, then you're doing something you should not be doing, then you're not waiting on God. God is waiting on you. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, God's waiting on you to do what you're supposed to do and to stop doing what you should not be doing. See, there's no reason uh, to be living an immoral uh, immoral life of sin when we have been born again. Ain't no need of you trying to live no double life because he that knoweth to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. So we should live right. Come on, talk to me. And we should live holy. God would not send us the Holy Spirit and give us power if he did not expect us to do it. If he didn't want us to live holy, he never would have given us the power to live holy. If he didn't want us to do right, he never would have gave us the power to live right. And so we should live right because that's what God expects. So we should live holy. We should live right. Listen, but this does not mean that the more moral we are, the more holy we are, or that doesn't mean that God is going to respond more quickly to us. Just because we're living right. And living holy, that does not exempt us from still having to wait on the Lord. Hallelujah. Our morals don't qualify us to receive something more quicker, uh, but it does get us in position. So we don't approach God off of our morals. 
In fact, we can't approach God off our morals. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But our morality is for us and not for God. God is holy. Whether we are holy or not. God is righteous whether we live righteous or not. God is perfect whether we live perfect maturely or not. It's not for God. It's for us. Come on, talk to me, somebody. But our morals are important because they keep us in a position or in a condition to where we can receive. Now, I don't want to get too deep in this today, uh, but let me be clear here. You just can't repent on something Sunday morning on your way into church. How many of y'all did that? You know, I'm getting ready to go into church. Lord, forgive me, Father, in the name of you. Bless you. How many of y'all did that? You just can't repent busting up in here on Sunday morning. You got to live. Come on, hello, somebody. The lifestyle every day. We must be faithful. We must be consistent. We must expect to walk in the newness of life. But the trouble that we run into, and often they seem to be overflowing even now, that we got these people that's living this double life. They come in here on Sunday and repent or ask God to pardon them but they have no intention on leaving out of here doing anything better it's as if I got to get through Sunday so I need to be free to praise God I don't want nothing to bother my conscience while I'm in service but after service is over I'm going right back to what I used to do ain't God all right I've seen people over the years run to God when they get in trouble. Run to the church when they get in a mess. Run to God when they need some help. But God does not work like that. God is not a lottery ticket. This is not Harold's Casino. God cannot be manipulated. God cannot be misused or construed. He knows. In fact, he knows us better then we know ourselves. So you ain't tricking God. Come on. You may trick somebody else and trip somebody else up, but you ain't tripping or tricking God. God got the trick and the treat. Because he know. Better than we know ourselves. So we must learn to wait on him. That's the tricky people. Still got to wait on God. Slick folk got to wait on God. The struggling people got to wait on God. Those that's doing well got to wait on God. The pretty folk got to wait on God. Ugly folk got to wait on God. Ugly in the spirit got to wait on God. Lies got to wait on God. Truth tellers got to wait on God. Everybody in here has to wait on God. And we can't hurry God no matter what we do. I need, I need to make you aware of that this morning. But I also need to make you aware that it takes time. And we're going to hit some scriptures here today. It takes time to become who God wants you to be. I need to say that again. It takes time to become who God wants you to be. Nobody just overnight rises to the top. Nobody overnight automatically is where they're supposed to be in God. You need to understand that this will help your Christian walk. In fact, listen, the greater the call or anointing that's on your life, the greater the time it will take for preparation and waiting. You don't want to let your light burn too quick. Because you only have one time to make a first impression. Hello, somebody. You can't do like Deacon Adams and shoot your wide out in domino. We already know what you got. You got to go long term. Hello, somebody. 
What we're talking about here is they did take time. Now, I'm going to give you some scriptures here because some of you are looking buck-eyed like you just saw a new mule at the head gate. But I'm going to help you here because it take time for God to work on you. And it take time for you to trust in God. Somebody was even talking about it in Sunday school. I think in the review, they were talking about people getting married so quickly. Let me show you what the problem is. We, we jump in there. He, he mentioned it today, Dick and Brian, I believe, was talking about how we get married off of feelings instead of getting married off of faith in a sense. And what he's saying is true because what we've done is we've discounted the time that it takes to trust somebody. It takes time to learn people's behavior. How they act. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me when things ain't going well. How do you handle when you ain't got no money? Hello, somebody. What type of tendency are present in your life that I didn't know about? I didn't know you snored like this. I didn't know you grind your teeth. I didn't know you slobbed at the mouth. I didn't know you couldn't handle being broke. take time let me say it take time take time now let's look at some scriptures here. the Bible says the Bible said listen that David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned for 40 years all indication point that David was about 15 years old when he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. So we're talking about 15 years of preparation and waiting. 15 years from being anointed to being chosen as the king over Israel. 15 years. Doing nothing but just waiting. All of you all that claim you got a call in your life and you're ready to jump up now, you better get your behind somewhere and sit down. <laughs> sit down and wait. You ain't ready yet. Look at somebody say, you ain't ready yet. They can give you the title, but that still don't mean you're ready. You can quote two scriptures, but you still ain't ready. Just because you don't wear your shoes on the wrong foot now don't mean you ain't ready. Come on. You got to wait. I know this ain't Bible class, but I want to give you some scriptures here. Let, let's go to First Samuel, First Samuel chapter 3. First Samuel chapter 3. I want to give you some scriptures here. Hallelujah. When you get over to First Samuel chapter 3, I want us to look at verses 19 through 21. The reason this needs to be clearly understood today. That you can't dig the hole like we've been talking about for two weeks. You can't dig the hole and then tomorrow be walking on dry ground at the top. No, no, no. It's going to take time. L. John got a horse, but I guarantee the first time he got that horse, that horse didn't know him and he didn't know it. <laughs> but it took time. Now, he can walk out there. He ain't got to beg the horse to come. Please, horse, please come here. Please, please. No, he gonna run, the, that horse gonna come running to him. Because it, it, it took time. Now, if animals can develop relationship with people like that. Why can't human develop relationship? Huh? If animals can connect with us and know who we are, you know they know who you are. Some of y'all got cats and dogs. Them dogs know who you are, don't they? You pull up on the yard, you put up on the yard, and they come running out there to reach you. Be glad to see you, wagging the tail, licking your shoes, all kind of stuff, because they're glad to see you. But the one that you love in the house is sitting on the couch. <laughs> Why come ain't none of them running out there? <laughs> I, 
you know, I, I'm all I'm, 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 I just, I just asked the question. Look at First Samuel. <laughs> First Samuel, chapter three, and verse nineteen. When you're there, say amen. The Bible says, and Samuel grew, look, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did not let none of his words fall to the ground. All of Israel from Dan to Bathsheba knew that Samuel, listen, was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in the shallow, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in shallow by the word of the Lord. You go back and you begin to look at this passage in this particular chapter. Samuel is a young boy at the time. Samuel is a young lad. He's not an adult. He's a child. But the Bible tells us that the Lord knew him and grew him up. He didn't let none of his words fall to the ground, but he's already established. Now, when we take our time and look at this deeper, we will see that from chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, nothing is said about Samuel. Hardly anything is said about Samuel except for chapter, uh, uh, chapter 4. If we go to chapter 4, uh, at the first verse, it said that the word of, of, the, of Samuel came to all Israel. And Israel went out against the Philistine to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistine pitched at Aphek. Now that's not talking about Samuel said something to Israel. It's the idea that the word of Samuel being the national prophet had gotten out to everybody. Samuel wasn't prophesying or saying anything. It's the idea that this man, this boy is going to be the national prophet. And that word got out everywhere. Chapter 4 goes by. Chapter 5 goes by. Chapter 6 goes by. And look, not until chapter 7 and verse 2. Do we see anything else about Samuel? When you get over there to chapter 7 and verse 2, look at what happened. And, and it came to pass by the ark abode at Kirjath Jerem that the, that the time was long. Somebody need to highlight that and circle that or make a note. Help me say the time was long. The time was long. Look at the next part. For it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented before the Lord. Did you see that? It was 20 years. 20 years before Samuel began to operate in his ministry. God, y'all don't see this thing today. One more example. One more example. We'll look quickly at the example of Joseph. Joseph chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 37. If we go back there, let's look at Genesis 37. I, maybe this, we do need to make this into a Bible class because y'all don't hardly come. Amen. Let's go. Genesis 37. Genesis 37. Another one more example. One more example. We, we see David is an example. We see Samuel as an example of people having to wait on the Lord. Uh, God is going to make you wait. God's going to make you wait. And you can't hate to wait. Even though Samuel was anointed the prophet, even though Samuel was chosen to be the prophet nation, everybody knew he was the national prophet, but he still had to wait 20 years before he began to operate in his ministry. Look at Joseph in Genesis 37 and 2. Look at the Bible. Look at what it says. Uh, Genesis 37 and 2. These are the generation of Jace, Jacob. Joseph being 17 years years old was feeding the flock with his brethren and the lad that was with his sons Beliah and the sons of Zelpha his father's wives and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report 
at this point, Joseph is 17 years old. This is the exact time that he was sold off into Egypt. He was 17. When his brothers betrayed him and put him in the pit and sold him off to Egypt, he was 17 years old. But look over here to Genesis uh, chapter 41 and verse 46. Genesis 41 and verse 46, praise God. When you get over there, you're going to see what the scripture says there. It said Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out of the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. So from 17 to 30 is how many years? 13 years. Now, for those of you who came in here today and you want to walk out of here and expect everything to be fixed tomorrow. Let me, let me, let me just back that up. All you that just ran up in here today said, I need a miracle, I need a blessing, I need a breakthrough, I need all that right now, 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 right now. This ain't the auction. What if God is trying to make you for 20 more years? You see how serious this waiting go to get now? And the people that I'm naming in this scripture, Joseph, David, Samuel, everybody knows these are chosen people, called folk, anointed people, set aside. If they had to wait, You and I, too, will have to wait. I don't have time to deal with Abraham and Sarah, but Hebrews 11 teaches us that many died in faith. Not having received the promise, they waited, listened, until they died. Do you love God enough? That even if he never does what you ask him to do, would you still serve him? I hope that's true. I hope you mean what you're saying because what you're saying is I'm willing to wait until I die. I'm willing to wait, God, if you don't give me what I need or I think I need I'm willing to die. Lord, if you don't answer my prayer request, if you don't give me my miracle, if you don't give me my answer, if you don't give me a breakthrough, I'm going to serve you until the day I die, even if you don't give me what I've been praying for. You know why everybody can't say yes to that? Because we want God to be Santa Claus. You know, I'll wait for a little while, Lord. I'm going to wait for a minute. You know how we are. Yeah, you know how. That's right. We ain't, uh, you know, we don't, we can't stand to wait on the mailman. <laughs> Look, I got stuff to do. Don't you be afraid. Don't mess with my time. People, you know, I'm going to be there too. And it's 2.15. You just about to just blow up. Wait a minute. They did. I don't know who they're messing with. I don't have this kind of time to be throwing away 15 minutes. That's, that's precious. Yeah. Uh, hello, somebody. We don't, we don't like to wait. And honestly, waiting is not anything that we should all enjoy because we expect things to happen quickly. We want things to happen immediately. We like to see progress. We want to see things moving. But the reality is when it comes down to God, you're going to have to learn how to wait. The song says you can't hurry God. You just got to wait. 
Now I listen this morning. Isaiah points it out. He said, waiting, listen, waiting is not just sitting back doing anything. Go back to Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to cut off because I ain't going to finish today. But we go back to Isaiah chapter 40. We begin to see waiting is not just sitting by doing anything. The word translate, translated as wait in this verse is the Hebrew word, Hebrew word quava, Q-A-V-A-H, quava, which literally means to bind together. Help me say bind together. It means to bind together or to twist together. Listen, the idea is to take two or more things and twist them into one and make them one. So what are we trying to twist together? We're trying to twist together three things. I want you to write these down. We're trying to twist together three things. God's will. That's number one. What's number one? We're trying to twist together three things. Number one is God's will. Number two is our willingness. <laughs> What's number two? Our willingness. We're trying to twist together, number one, God's will. Number two, our willingness. And then number three, time. Woo! What's number three? Why ain't nobody shout? We're trying to twist together God's will, our willingness, and time. When God's willingness or God's will and our willingness and time are combined... We will fulfill his purpose for our lives. But most folk, including believers, struggle with either all three, two of these, or one. Either we struggle with God's will because we don't know what it is, or we don't care what it is. Or we don't want to know what it is. Or we know what it is and don't want to do it. When, you, when, you, when you're struggling with God's will, it could be any one of those. You know what it is. You just, God told you to, to do right. But you're, you know, no, I, I'm going to do right. But not yet. That's struggling with God's will. Struggling with God's will. You know you're supposed to pray. Ain't nobody got to tell you you're supposed to Yeah, I know I'm supposed to pray, but... Uh, uh, I get around to it. Struggling with God's will. It's not necessarily you don't know. You could know. But then there are others who just don't want to know God's will. I don't want to come to church because that man, all they're going to do is tell me what I'm doing wrong. I already know I'm doing wrong. Well, if you got enough sense to know all that, you're going to get whooped with many strikes. <laughs> we struggle with God's will. And then other, other than struggling with God's will, we struggle with our willingness. Struggle with our willingness is because real obedience, listen, real obedience comes from a willing heart. We aren't always willing to go where God says go. We're not always willing. Don't look at me sanctified like that. We're not always willing to say what God said say. We're not always willing to get outside of our comfort zone and to interact with people that we're not familiar with. No, no, we're not willing. I'll go, Lord, to the folk you want me to go, but just make sure these people look like this. Come on, Jonah. Hello, somebody. I'll go, Lord. 
But don't send me down to Nineveh. Nineveh? Come on, G. Please send me to Jerusalem. Why in the world are you sending me out here to Nineveh? He did not want to go. And guess what? He did not go. He got on his ship going the other way. It's amazing to me the thing that we will do to avoid God. All that foolishness Jonah did and end up having to go anyway. And he comes in with a message, one of the most, I mean, anybody could have preached this message. This message was one that just, it was almost half-hearted. This jacked up message he preached, and everybody still repented. And he got mad about it. Our willingness. Don't let God have to throw you in the bottom of the ocean. Until you say, yes, Lord. Don't let God have to whoop you to the bed of affliction before you say, okay, God. You shouldn't have to want to come in on crutches and wheelchairs. Hello, somebody. On your way out of here before you get ready to serve the Lord. While you're young, you got your energy, you got your strength. You can actually do something. You need to be serving the Lord. We struggle with our willingness. And most importantly, we struggle with time. You know why we struggle with time? We struggle with time because we don't know how long we have. <laughs> and we don't know how long God expects us to wait. You know, they've got this thing. Some of these hospitals are getting a little bit more better now. They give you a certain time. Now, if, you, if we haven't seen you by this time, you know, you press this button or you contact somebody, you get somebody involved because we realize that, you know, you want to utilize or maximize your time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You no? Know? Say, we don't want you to just sit up in the waiting room all day. We want you to be able to get some, some relief. At the end of the day, though, you don't have no button with God. You can't press the little button and say, okay, you know, Lord, you need to get in this room and take care of me. Huh? You can't go in the room and say, Lord, I'm going to give you 10 minutes now. And when my 10 minutes is up, Jesus, either you're going to be the dead son or I'm going to go over your head. I'm going to the one that's over you. <laughs> How many of y'all know that ain't gonna work? <laughs> who over him? <laughs> who you gonna go over? <laughs> yeah, who you, yeah. So you know that's not gonna work. We struggle with time because we don't know how long God expects us away. So this is where patience comes into the equation. Let's go to Hebrews 10 and 35. Patience comes into the equation because now patience is willing to wait while time continues to run. Patience is waiting while you're losing time. And we're letting the sun burn up on us. They say in the western, we burn in daylight. We're losing time. But we got to be patient. Hebrews 10 and 35, if you have it, say amen. amen. Look at what the Bible says. It says, cast not away therefore your confidence, which you have great which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. I want you to notice that all three of the things that we just covered are in this one verse. God's will, our willingness, and time are right here in verse 36. Ye have need of patience. That's time. After you have done, that's willingness. The will of God, God's will. We must be willing to wait. Because wasting, a waiting is not wasting time. 
But waiting is using time to work on you. I don't want to mess with your prayer life today. And I, I certainly think you should ask God for what you want. He told us. What sort of things you desire when you pray? Believe you shall receive. Ask, it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, the door will be open. I don't want to mess with what you got going. Your little system in place. But I just want to introduce something to the equation here. Maybe the Lord is not telling you to change what you're asking for. But maybe he's telling you to change the time you expected it in. Oh, that, that's a nugget. Somebody missed that. Maybe it's not that God not going to do it and he can't do it. We know he's able. But maybe we, maybe we just need to take some, the limits of time off of this and say, Lord, when my willingness, your will, and the time is right, let it be done. You can liberate yourself from all the stress and all the worry and all the confrontation and all of the confusion that goes along with that if you just turn it over to the Lord. Say, so, Lord, I'm willing. And I'm going to give you the time to do what you, your will is for my life. Isaiah wraps it up, and I'm, I'm going to close this today. So if you wait on the Lord, I'm going to renew your strength. When we wait, we will be recharged. When we wait, we will be restored. When we wait, we will be revived because patience becomes the product of real faith. In other words, I need patience with my faith. My patience is waiting with the expectation without complaining but waiting while I suffer for bearing and carrying the burdens that have been assigned to me. Mm, Lord God. Patient is working on my mind. My will and my heart till I conform to a willingness that says, not my will, but your will be done. Realize today is not something to shout about. But the psalmist says in Psalm 135, he says, I waited for the Lord. My soul waited. And his word did I hope. My soul waited for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. Yeah. Psalm 37 and 34 said, wait on the Lord. Keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. Wait patiently on the Incline your ear to hear us, O oh Lord, as we wait upon you, as the eagle stirs her nest and fluttered up her wings and spread it abroad her wings and taken up and bear us on her wings, so must we wait on the Lord. The message today, don't hate the wait, is for somebody in here now. Honestly, it's probably everybody in here. You can enjoy the wait when you stop complaining. And you can get more from it instead of hating it so much, start celebrating it. 
Because I know something good's going to happen. May not come when I want him. But he's always on time. He knows what I need. He's going to supply my needs. And I'm just going to leave it in his hands. Everybody stand to your feet today. We're not going to call the altar prayer today. Because we're just going to assume everybody this message is for you. Yeah. And look at your neighbor and say, you too now, you too. Uh, don't act like it ain't. Is everybody in here today? We're going to pray. Father, today, we've heard your word. We know you have the power. Work on our willingness. Some of us said yes, but we really didn't mean it. Some of us said yes, Lord, we'll go. I'll go all the way, but then things got in the way. And we released, we stopped, we backed up, we went backwards. Somebody here today is in need now. Need of just a confirmation. Speak to that spirit right now. Even now, as you begin to minister to them, Lord, let them know that it's going to take time. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. Help us not to rush. Help us not to rush through what you're doing. But help us to wait. Help us to see the value of waiting. Father, even now, as you minister to the saints in this room, stir their hearts to go back and do first things again. Stir their heart to go back and redo things they did wrong. Stir hearts today as we reevaluate and prepare and condition ourselves. We can all use a little more waiting. Now, Lord, even our willingness, even where our willingness is not where it needs to be, work on it. But even with time, teach us how to use it wisely. Teach us even now how to, to use it where we get the maximum from the time that we waited. We thank you today. We praise you today for the great joy that he is in waiting. We wait on you. As the psalmist said, early will I seek thee. My soul will make an inclination unto thee. Early will we seek you in a dry and thirsty place because we wait on you. Our longing is unto you. As a deer panting for the water, so does our soul long after you. We wait on you, Lord. I pray for patience. All around this room. That we will be patient with God. And be patient with people. And be patient with our family members. Even be patient with ourselves. Lord, we know this message is not an excuse to sit back and do nothing. But what we need to do. Show us how to do it. And what we need to stop doing. Show us how to stop doing it. Make us. Mold us, shape us, in Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, you can be seated.